rained a lot in Ireland, so you were inside a lot. So I would go through one of my mother's cookery books and pick something out and then be like, okay, I'm gonna try how to make this chicken a la king or stir fry a Sunday. And I'll be like, ma'am, I'm gonna take care of dinner. I used to love watching cooking shows. There wasn't that many of them on the TV and any time that there was some on the TV, they were professional chefs like the Rue Brothers or Raymond Blanc or Marco Pierre White back in, in his early days. Gordon Ramsay in the background. You know, I just always, I, I always loved it. I always wanted to become a chef then from that point onwards. I'm Darren Laws. I'm the chef and owner of Il Bambino. I moved uh, because I felt that there was better restaurants in England or in London than there was in Ireland at the time and worked for a guy called Pierre Kaufman and I remember the first day in his kitchen and I he had all the sauces in jars on the stove in like a bain-marie like a hot water bath I remember putting my spoon in and tasting it and I never tasted anything like it in my life it was just the glands in the back of my mouth just I don't know, words couldn't describe it. I walked away and I walked out the door and I thought to myself, am I ever, ever, ever going to know how to make something like that? Because if I can make something like that, it, it, at that time, I'm like, if I can make something like that, that's the peak, that's the top of Everest right there. Because how can you make that from bones? How did you get that from bones? How did that happen? And then you find out and you get shown and then you perfect it. I didn't want to do food that was as convoluted anymore. I just wanted to kind of, I wanted to pull it back. I just wanted to open like a panini shop and just, or a sandwich shop. I'm just trying to give the neighborhood something that wasn't there before and we wanted to up the game and say, okay, listen, my background as a chef, even though I'm doing something now as simple as panini, I wanted to bring some of those flavor profiles maybe that you wouldn't imagine, typical with a sandwich, I wanted to bring them in and introduce them to, to a humble sandwich. As you get older, you become maybe also a little bit smarter. So you just find ways of achieving more with maybe less. Some people might, they might just have a saute pan in their house and they cook every day, saute everything. But there's other techniques, there's roasting and braising and everything like, and then the, and the chef kind of encompasses all of that. So you can always introduce people to different ways of having something. So when you take anything and, and you add color to it, you, you, you change its flavor profile. If you take a carrot and you boil it, it tastes one way. It's not very exciting, it just, just tastes of sweetness. But when you take that carrot and you give it some color and you put it in the oven and you kind of dry it out a little bit and you remove that moisture, because when you remove moisture from anything, you're, you're drying it out. And when you dry it out, you intensify its flavor. You, you might think that you can't get that much flavor out of a carrot, but you can, and it's all it's just, it's, it's all about technique.
things that helped put us on the map right at the beginning was soups. And everybody used to say, you know, what kind of stock do you use? Or I'm like, we don't use any stocks. We don't. And the soups are very, very simple. I can count on one hand the ingredients in probably all the soups on one hand. And one of the secrets to those soups was when those soups came off the heat and they were either pureed or whatever, they were finished. That's when we would take a handful of herbs and put them in. And they just bloom into the soup. I think one of the coolest things as a chef is when you see another chef's collection of books and uh, you can just get lost in it, you know, see what they see what they used to read, uh, see what they have. It's great. You could you could you, you could lose yourself for days and I think uh, other chef's collections of books. So the Bakewell Tart, this is it right here. Elgin Food, Valerie Childs, is he? Valerie Childs. And uh, that's where I used to get, you know, you asked me where it all began. This is one of my mother's cookbooks that she gave me that I asked her could I have it because it just brought back so many memories. And this is where I used to on the weekends. So, you know, I'm going to make fairy cakes, um, trifle, all came from this book right here. And my very first book ever is this one right here, Raymond Blanc. <clears throat> and... I used to go to the bookstore every single day and read this book from cover to cover because I couldn't afford it. And I would just go and look at it. And then when I did finally get the money to buy it, it was the only book I had for about a year. And I'm not kidding you, I could tell you what was on page. The, you know, I didn't have a TV or anything. I could tell you what was on page 54. I could tell you, um, what was on page 150. I just had it memorized from cover to cover. That's all I did. Look, look at all these notes here. So this guy's Raymond Blanc, self-taught. Uh, was a waiter one night. The chef walked out. He was asked, hey, listen, can you jump behind the line, line and, uh, and finish out the evening? And he did. And he went on to become then one of the best chefs in the world. And he had such a beautiful way of making food just look so attractive. This woman here, I think is, you wanna talk about how to take simplicity and perfect it. That's it right here. Miss Hamilton, Prune. One of my favorite books, one of my favorite people. My goal is as a chef is to perform that alchemy, is to take something and to create something fantastic. Flavor is detected by your nose, so you're, you're always going to detect flavor before you detect taste. There's some flavors push and some flavors pull against each other, and it's how you all kind of put them together. Instead of using a lemon, why don't we use a preserved lemon? So this lemon tastes this way, which is great, but if you take that lemon and you do something to it, all of a sudden, its flavor profile has completely changed and it just takes on this, I don't know, I can't even describe what a, what a, what a preserved lemon tastes like. And it, it, you know, you, you score the lemon, you cut down through it and you pack it full of salt. It's a Moroccan technique. You pack it full of salt, you put it into a jar, you fill that jar with other lemons and salt, you pour lemon juice over it, you put it in a dark place, cool, for about two months or a month. And, and when you pop that lid and you take them out, it's just, I don't know, it's like a different fruit altogether. It's a lemon except, my God, it's, it, it's, it's, it's so exotic. If I was to tell people actually how little there was in like the olive spread, like why does the olive taste so good? It's because it's just olives and extra virgin olive oil. If you just rain it back. There's nothing wrong with adding thyme to it. There's nothing wrong with adding capers to it. But we just, that's what I've just done. It's just a briny olive and extra virgin olive oil. The, the sun-dried tomatoes. It's just sun-dried tomatoes blended with extra virgin olive oil. 
Extra virgin olive oil on its own tastes amazing if you ever drag a piece of bread through it and sprinkle it with salt. Now imagine just pureeing sun-dried tomatoes into it. So you've taken a tomato which is full of umami, you take out all the moisture and you dry it out. So you've now compounded its flavor. And now you're gonna blend it into oil? Well, Jesus, that's, you put that in a piece of bread and that, that, that's, the stars are right there. You know, texture is also a very big one too. You know, when, when I watch people bite into that panini and you hear that crunch, or when the guys are cutting it and you hear that crunch, it's like, and you watch people eating it and they're, they're sitting there and they're, they're all the same. I've watched tens of thousands of people sit down and eat a panini and it's always the same. You bite into it and then they start looking at it like, wow, the friggin' hell is in here. And that's the idea. Every chef goes to work every day for the most part and tries to do the best job he can. There's nothing like getting a home cooked meal. It doesn't matter who it's from. And like I said, it doesn't matter maybe if it's bad because the person wasn't a good cook. But for a chef, the fact that you went out and you shopped all day yesterday, maybe you the day before, you spent yesterday in the kitchen and today in the kitchen. But we know the effort that you put in and we're very, very appreciative. Because I think that some people can feel intimidated in fighting a chef to dinner, but you shouldn't. He's the guy actually who likes it the most. And he's probably gonna bring you the best gift as well, to be honest. Thank you.